The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Okay. Uh, so just a quick show hands. <laughs> I haven't asked a question yet. <laughs> How many of you guys uh, have used Asterisk before? That's pretty good. Okay, and pigeon or game? Yeah, that's kind of what I figured. And uh, LTTPD? <laughs> uh, even one? Are you serious or are you just making that up? Wow. That's pretty well. Okay, so uh, it took me a while to come up with a name for this presentation, but Russell suggested template 2 since that was the file name of what I had to start from. So template 2. Um, or also lessons learned from running an open source company. And uh, as usual, I kind of came up with this one last night. So it's, um, I don't know why, but I kind of thought maybe I would try to build it based on Monty Python's Meaning of Life. Anybody seen that movie before? <laughs> okay, anybody raise your hands if you've seen it? Okay, so at least some of the people will understand. So what I did is I took each part of the movie and then I tried to somehow correlate it to running an open source company. So it's kind of, it kind of works in some areas, maybe not so much in some others, but uh, we'll just see how it goes. Uh, so part one, Miracle Birth. So if you want to uh, start a company, I, I should say, by the way, um, this is going to be probably less of a technical presentation and more about, you know, what it's like to try to be an entrepreneur and, maybe some hints about how to get started. Russell is doing uh, a presentation over in the other ballroom right after this one that's going to be, oh, it's in this one? The theater downstairs. In the theater downstairs, okay. And that will be a technical discussion on asterisk. So um, if you're technical, you'll probably want his more than, more than mine. But anyway, um, first of all, y you do need to kind of know something about what you want to do, or at least what you want to start to do. Um, and, and that means really kind of have some kind of purpose for what you want to do, uh, your business you want to start out with. In the case of uh, Digium, the company behind uh, uh, Asterisk, the original purpose was actually to provide Linux tech support. So I had made a, a tech support website called linuxsupport.net. I don't know if any of you guys had ever seen it, but I decided I would try to commercialize that. Um, my strategy was going to be to get contractors that were kind of all around the country to be able to work uh, on doing Linux tech support. And that would just be kind of like a clearinghouse for getting questions over to people. And right from the start, started an LLC, kind of made the business so that it could, it could really uh, operate. And I definitely encourage you guys, when you start out, start with, with creating a real entity if you're going to go build the business to keep yourself protected and to make things easier for you as you go down the way down the road. Now the other side of that is don't feel like you have to know everything about what you're doing. That is to say, don't feel like you have to do things the same way other people did and don't feel like you have to plan everything out to the finest detail because things are going to change and you, you want to know kind of how to start but you want to keep an open mind towards what the situation really is in the world and adapt what you're doing to what, uh, what is demanded. Um, in the case of, of uh, Digim, I, I really didn't have any money to get started, so you know, put my own PCs together and put my own website together. All the things you would normally do, except one of the things is I needed a phone system, and I decided to put my own phone system together. Right? So that was kind of pick your battles and your build by decisions. I probably tended to build a lot more than maybe was practical, but in the end it ended up working out well because, last point here, you probably won't end up doing what you started out to do. And even though we started out to do Linux tech support, fast forward a couple of years, and uh, tech support's an easy business to get into, but it sucks. It's really, really painful at times. Um, and uh, what we found was that people were more interested in this open source phone system called Asterisk that we had created than they were in the actual Linux tech support business, which actually worked out well because I was much more interested in writing software in Asterisk than I was in providing technical support uh, to customers over the phone and over the web. 
So that brings us to part two, growth and learning. Um, one of the most critical things is to try to, to, to find and engage different mentors. So people that have founded successful companies tend to get in this mode where they, they feel like they have all this knowledge they can try to share with other people. Um, and you should just, just kind of soak it up as much as you can and talk to other successful people, some people that have been successful with companies and maybe some that whose companies failed, and just kind of hear what a lot of people have to say about it. Um, you're going to get a lot, if you talk to a dozen different successful entrepreneurs, you're going to get a dozen different answers for what you ought to do to be successful, and I'm absolutely just one of those. So, um, But you as, as, as the, the entrepreneur, as the person that's getting started, you have to kind of homologate all that together and figure out how it applies to what you're doing. And uh, to some degree, that even goes for small startups where you may not be the founder, but you're someone that's playing a, you know, a big role in what's going on with the company. Secondly, um, remember that you are working for your customers and for your employees. So as you start to, you know, I ask people sometimes, why do you want to go start a business? And some people say, well, because I don't want to work for anybody else. And that's just, just a terrible, terrible attitude to have because you will be unemployed very quickly if you do that um, because you do work for your customers and for your employees. That is to say that you know, the customers are the people that are giving you money and you have to do things for them that they want, that they choose to pay you money for. And you have to you know, satisfy their level of of um, really, I guess, their demand of, of what they want out of you in terms of quality, in terms of responsiveness. Y you know, if you work for somebody, they kind of have to go through a lot of effort to get rid of you, but all the customer has to do is stop writing a check, right? And that's it. It's done. They don't, they don't have to have a reason. They just decide they don't like doing business with you. So really remember that. And the other half of that is that you work for your uh, employees. So when you bring people into the company, when, when you get to the point that you need help, remember that a lot of what you do is going to decide whether or not those people are going to stay uh, and continue to work for you, whether, you know, what kind of quality of output you're going to uh, be able to get out of people. Are they enjoying their job and trying to make the company successful, or are they coming in and saying, man, I hate going to work every day and I'm just staying here until I can find something else that I can go do. And then uh, you've got to maintain balance. So most, you know, my background has always been as a technologist. So when I created Game, for example, there wasn't any business model behind it. Um, and, and there really wasn't any business model behind Asterisk other than being a cheap PBX for us to use at Digium. But eventually, you know, if you're building a business, you have to be able to um, maintain some kind of balance between the technology you're, you're creating and turning that technology into a business. It's not enough to just say, hey, I've got this cool technology. You've got to figure out how are you going to find customers, what are your customers going to pay, what does it cost you to make it, you know, what is required in terms of delivering it, what are their expectations, um, you know, is there a channel, are there resellers, um, you know, what is your, how much are you going to burn, to get to where you're, you're trying to be profitable, you know, all these other factors, these sort of business factors. And by the way, I had absolutely none of that when I started Linux Support Services, right? So I had zero business knowledge, acumen, any of that. And to a great degree, the fact that we're even still here is, is a factor of just being at the right place at the right time because it was like, it didn't matter what we did, people just wanted to buy it in the early days. It's not like that now. You, we really have to work at it now. But in the early days, there was just, I mean, there was, there was a total dearth of stuff in this field that we were in, in terms of open source communication. Um, and we had so many early adopters, people that would, you know, buy the products, you know, it works on my box, that's good enough for me, hand it to me, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll talk probably a little bit more about that. Um, it is kind of a little out of order, but I had to follow the movie. So this is, 
so this is, this is really not the order I would put these things in, but okay, fighting each other. It's kind of afterwards, after this. Okay, um, understand the importance of, of what OSS is, right? What is open source software? This is a model for how you develop software, right? And it can be a marketing model. Um, in the asterisk world, um, the fact that asterisk was open source and people could download it, they could, they could customize it, allowed us to get into markets all around the world that we would never have otherwise been able to get into. We actually do about half our business outside the U.S., and we're based in Huntsville. And with the exception of one 21-year-old uh, sales guy that runs all around the world, has a passport about that thick, um, we don't really have any employees outside the U.S. that are representing uh, the company. So it's, uh, to get there has involved the fact that we were open source. It got us into to businesses that were able to download the software and try it out and then contact us when they needed help rather than us trying to go out there and find them. I mean, just as an example, and you all heard of BT, British Telecom? So they actually had a conference about open source telephony. And, you know, we would have had no way to just call up BT and say, hey, by the way, we have this open source phone system for you. You know, you don't even know where to start, but because they were able to access that software, they got it and then contacted us with what their needs were. So it, it, it's a really great development and marketing model, but it is not a business model, okay? Open source by itself, you know, people ask me, how do you make money giving away free software? And the answer is very easy. You don't, okay? There's nothing about giving away free software that inherently gets you money, Right? It is all about selling products, services, you know, packaging, whatever it is that customers want. All that is just traditional business. You have to have something that people want to pay you for, and that is how you build a business. And so, you know, OSS has its own sort of things associated with that, but you just have to kind of remember what its role is. Uh, another thing, and this may seem really obvious, but you'd be blown away sometimes at how many companies are open source companies and don't leverage open source internally. Okay, open source is a competitive advantage that sets you apart. So when you are competing with other companies in whatever field, so when we compete with Cisco or Via, uh, you know, open source is a huge competitive advantage for us in certain sets of accounts. In other kinds of accounts, it can be actually something where you have to explain to people what it is because they think that they can't depend on free software. You guys are probably very familiar with those arguments. Um, but it is a huge thing. But you need to use open source in your own company too. If the only open source product you use is your own, that doesn't reflect well for your customers. You know, when they come and visit and everything you have runs on Windows except this one product, that's just not good. You need to, you need to be able to show that you're also capable of running on open source software if you're going to com convince other people that they should be able to, uh, to use that. And prepare for the worst. Um, you know, at, when you develop something like Pigeon or Game or whatever, you're just interested in seeing people use it, you know? You don't have anything around it. But when you are building a company and you have people that are working for you and you have mouths to feed and families that are dependent upon the success of what you're doing, that is, that is different. You really have to think about how am I going to get the users of the software to want to buy stuff from my company? How am I going to monetize and support uh, what I've been doing? Um, it's actually kind of funny, uh, just as a side here. When I went to school at Auburn, which is kind of like, like a clone of Clemson. I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to Auburn. Yeah, he, do what? Auburn did? I don't know. I'll assume Auburn did. I think they had a coach that started at Auburn and then came to do the thing in Clemson. So I'll assume Auburn had it first, but I don't, I don't really know. Um, anyway, um, I actually did a phone interview with, uh, with Microsoft for a job when I was in college. And so they asked me about, you know, okay, what all of you use? And I was like, well, I've used GCC and uh, developed them, you know, can make my own make files, all this kind of stuff, and GTK and all that. So I took all those notes, and the last question she asked me on the phone was, if you could write your own job description at Microsoft, what would it be? And I said, 
keep in mind, by the way, this is like 1998, 99. I said, I'd like to write free software for Linux. <laughs> and there was this silence at the other end of the phone. And then she said, well, I'll see if we have anyone working on that. <laughs> and then I got my rejection letter. Um, but, uh, that, you know, th that is what I have endeavored to actually do here with Digium, is not only to be able to write free software for Linux, but to be able to employ other developers and to encourage an entire community to develop free software for Linux. Um, but you have to understand, I mean, when I created Asterisk, I didn't have any vision of any of that, right? The company had nothing to do with telecom. That was just not what we did. Um, it, it was a project that, you know, I wrote and I was interested in, just like, just like Pigeon, Gaming Pigeon, you know. Here it is. I'm happy to contribute this out. I hope this is helpful for people. When dollar signs start getting involved, then there are some, can be some emotionally taxing moments for you. Um, in particular, when things really start to get big and you start getting competitors that are actually selling the same services and products and things like that in competition with you using the very software that you have created, right? I mean, it's one thing when people use the software and, hey, I downloaded Asterisk and it's working great and I'm making a ton of money, but I don't really need to buy anything from you, but thanks anyway, you know? I mean, that's fine. You know, you get used to that, but it's really hard emotionally when you're attached to a project, right? Because, I mean, when you develop open source, you're rarely developing it just because it's your job, right? It's something you're passionate about. And you have to understand that if you turn it into a business, it's something that you're going to run into is where you're competing with the very software that you have created, uh, either directly or indirectly. And this is the middle of the presentation. And if you've seen the movie, this would make sense. If not, probably not. Okay. <laughs> part four, the middle years. Okay, so this is really the one I probably would have put first. Um, know when to delegate. It, it is, uh, when you first start out and it's just you, it is important that you know how to, like, let things go. And the easiest things are, first of all, the things that you both aren't any good at and don't like doing. Okay. Th those are the easiest to get delegated to somebody else, right? And then you have the things that either you do enjoy doing or that you aren't really all that bad at to delegate away. And those are a little bit more challenging. And then the third thing, the hardest, the really the hardest one, is when you get to the size that there are things that you're good at and you enjoy doing, but you just don't have the time to do all of them and you still have to delegate those away. And that can be very challenging, but you have to at some point be willing to do that. Um, you need to hire people when you do that delegation that you can trust. You can't get people and then constantly be looking over their shoulder. So for example, when I hired my first sales guy at Digium, um, first of all, that was a huge breakthrough, by the way. Like when you have one person whose job is just to go out there and sell, it is amazing what that does to how much money comes in. That is not something to be multitasked. That is, someone needs to be focused on that job. But anyway, um, when I did so, it was important that anything that had to do with selling was spoken with one voice. That meant that if someone came to me and said, hey, I want to get this special deal or whatever, that it always had to, whatever the answer was, had to come from Greg, our sales guy. And I might talk to him and ask him and say, hey, this person came to me. What do you think about this or whatever? But always let the people do their jobs. And if you think they're doing a good job, then, you know, you've got the right person in place and let them do it. And if you don't like the job they're doing, don't try to change what they're doing. Just get, you know, if they're not the right person that, that, that you feel comfortable with, get someone in there that is the right person. But it's got to be, you know, in order to delegate, it's got to be people that you can trust and that you can work with, and you've got to let them do their jobs. And be prepared for the challenges of having coworkers. So office drama starts when you have three people, because then you have two people that can talk about the third without them being there. And that's really all you need. So just be, be prepared that things will kind of start when you have 
uh, when you have three. And um, to some degree, when you get more people, you're going to start losing visibility into everything that is going on. So I tell people a lot of times that starting a company is probably a lot like what raising a child is like. At four years, you might know 90% of what's going on in your four-year-old's life. And, and you know, you're trying to make them be the person you think they ought to be. And at, say, 16 or 18 or 19, maybe you know 10% of what's going on in their life, and they're absolutely their own person. And you try to kind of interact with them, but you have to understand that, you know, they're not the thing, they're not just a person that you're trying to make be you. They are really their own person at that point. Um, evaluate capitalization requirements. So um, this is one area where I differ from a lot of, uh, of other companies. A lot of companies think you should go out and try to get, you know, venture capital early on. And it is kind of easy because, you know, if you get, you know, there's nothing quite as easy as spending other people's money. It, I mean, it really is just... Uh, a lot easier. Do what? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, but uh, I actually think you should bootstrap the company as long as possible. Try to get to the point as early as you can that you are selling a product and making money. Because whether it's venture capital or loan or whatever else you need to be able to grow and expand your company, you know, people only want to give you money when you don't need it. And venture capital is a totally different experience if you're a profitable company that doesn't really need the venture capital than it is if you are desperately needing it because you know you, if you don't get money, you're not going to be able to continue for two or three more months. So it's, it's real important to, in my mind, to try to get that, that uh, business going. We actually... Um, got uh, venture capital in 2006, um, and I'll probably tell you a little bit about that um, when we get to this last one. So this, is, this last one is one that I really didn't do very well in the beginning. In, in fact, I would say I had to make a very discreet kind of change here, but um, build infrastructure as needed, right? Again, this comes back to I didn't have any business knowledge, right? So I just kept growing the business just like it was a small business. And um, I ran the company as, a, as president until January of 2007. And let me try to explain where things were in January of 2007. We were about 80 people. We had been profitable for five years with growth every quarter. We had never, and I mean never, had a budget of any kind. Nothing. Not even like percentages or anything. We had what I would call flower shop financials. So I could tell you like what we spent on travel last year, and I could tell you what we spent on rent, but I couldn't tell you what we spent on marketing. I couldn't tell you what we spent on engineering. Every time somebody wanted something, right, they would bring a little purchase rec and explain what it is that they wanted to get, and I would, you know, yeah, okay, that's fine, or go see if you can find a cheaper alternative or whatever. They had no idea how much they were going to get to spend in a year, right? And that worked fine when you were a small company, but when you get, you know, 80 people, things start really getting difficult at that point, right? I had 13 people that directly reported to me, plus all the engineers, because we didn't have any engineering management at all, and we didn't have a product quality department or anything, so engineers would test their own stuff, and then we'd ship it. And, you know... If you start this a little earlier, then it is a lot easier to make the transition from doing that to having a you know, more traditional build cycle and you know, the stuff you need to be able to convince bigger customers that you can reliably produce product. Um, we actually did the ISO 9001 recently, which wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. It only took a few months, and, and nobody ever needed to talk to me, so that was all I needed. Um, <clears throat> But uh, if you can at least get enough infrastructure in place to where, you know, you kind of know where you're spending, um, that you can kind of make plans going forward about, you know, what kind of numbers you need to see coming in the door to manage going out, and try to get some people involved in the company that have actually had business experience before. You could go in, if you don't have any business experience, you can still work with people, hire managers that do have business experience, and probably be successful. But you 
or you can have a lot of business experience and you can you know grow a lot of that management base but you can't know nothing about business and hire a bunch of other people that know nothing about business and then you know that that's just really hard to make work so build it out to, as needed and that kind of to some degree also goes for your physical infrastructure you know you want to have enough space to be able to grow into you don't want to have to move every two or three months um, and you want to have you know good enough networking and stuff for people to be successful All right, live organ transplants, I have nothing. I, uh, I really can Yeah. Yeah, so we uh, we had chaos. Okay, well, we started with chaos, and then we tried to organize the chaos to some degree. And that's probably about, now it's much less. Uh, well, it depends on, again, on how you do it. So we, we did it in, in um, I guess about 2005, I kind of recognized that things were starting to get bigger than I was going to be comfortable doing. And I elected to bring in a venture capital person to help me build a management team for the company. And that decision was largely based on, you know, I've always had this thought that you want everybody kind of bought into the same goal. And a consultant, oh, no offense or anything, but no, to the, the gentleman behind you. <laughs> no offense, but a consultant doesn't really have any, like, plus or minus as to whether his work is successful or not. But if someone is invested in the company, then they absolutely have a reason for you to be successful. So I wanted someone involved that was invested in the company. And we found um, one particular venture capital firm where the guy was all about how to build the business, you know, knew how to hire the management team, knew how to, you know, get the right people to know how to set up, you know, forecasts for production and all that kind of stuff that we really needed to be able to be successful. Um, and so uh, that's the route that we went. And then in January of 07, I actually got to hire my old uh, boss, uh, Danny Windham, who was the president of uh, another company called AdTran that was in town where I had been a co-op student. And I had him come over and be the CEO of Digium. And then he had, was then tasked with creating all the infrastructure that I had neglected for the previous five years. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, that was kind of how we did it. If, in retrospect, I would say you've got to, if you can do it a little more smoothly, sort of add people as you as you can, get people that are that are not just qualified to do the job today, but are qualified to do the job where you think you're going to be in a year or two. Now, it, it, it's um, one of the hard things to understand is that you know you got people that are small company people, and you have people that are big company people, and not all the people that you hire in that first time are going to be able to make the transition to be a big company. It's just some people are much better when there's, you know, a thousand different things that have to be done and they want to do a little bit of everything. But when, it, when the job starts getting more and more narrow, that they get, you know, it's just not something they enjoy anymore. And you have to understand that, you know, not everybody is going to make it that whole way. And by the same token, you know, there are a lot of people that work at Digium right now that there is no way they would have come to work at Digim when we were 10 people because we didn't, you know, th there wasn't enough definition in terms of what job functions were or, you know, you didn't have enough work for someone that was really specialized in a particular area. So it's just, it's something that kind of changes over time. Um, but again, because it was something that was so in demand in the market, all of these mistakes and lack of structure and all that was managed to get swept under the rug for years and years and years because there was just so much demand for what we were doing and nobody else was doing it. And now, you know, that, as you can imagine, that is not something that sustains forever. That at some point people are going to go, wow, that is a nice business to be in. I'm going to go into that business. And now, you, you know, we have to do things really right. We've got to be able to deliver product on time. You know, we have, you know, people we've hired out of the automotive industry to actually make sure that all of our our product reliability follows, you know, very strict guidelines to make sure that, 
um, that we don't get returns because if you know you can imagine we do half our business outside the U.S. Um, you know if a card's let's say it's a three hundred dollar card by the time you have to ship it out and ship it back it gets real expensive um, especially outside the U.S. so you really want to have great quality. Can I help answer it? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so nothing for live organ transplants, but uh, although maybe you could kind of describe building out that management team. It just didn't feel quite right. Um, the autumn years. Okay. Uh, things will change. Um, I, I think this probably works for politics, too. You know, our new politicians all think they're going to be totally different from everybody else. And people that start new businesses are always like, man, I'm going to be so completely different from every other big business, and I'm never going to get stuck in meetings. And, you know, you can come up, dream up with all kinds of things that you're going to do totally different from everybody else. But at some point, you know, as you get bigger, these things slowly, and it's not all at once, but just slowly they will tend to change because it just, the bigger you get, the more of this kind of structure ends up, eating into things, and, and it will change. You just have to be willing to accept that. I mean, Digium, you know, today is a spectacularly fun place to work. I mean, we had casual day not long ago and had jam sessions in the lobby, and, uh, you know, it was just uh, in, in casual day at Digium, I should say, is kind of different from casual day at most places <laughs> since this is normally how I would go to work. Uh, casual day, this time I went in uh, swimming trunks, and, uh, and a floaty. <laughs> <laughs> and we had people in pajamas, you know. I mean, how many companies would I have pajama parties? But anyway, but still, I mean, it's, it's a little different than it was, you know, when we were just 10 people. And after work, we'd all go out to a bar and have an all-nighter where we drank and wrote software. You know, it's just, it's not always, you know, some things will have to kind of adapt, you know. Now we have an HR department to argue with employees about whether or not they have to actually wear shoes at work. You know, because you get some people who just want to walk around barefoot, and that wouldn't have been an issue before, but okay. Um, anyway, as you get bigger and bigger, you know, not all your coworkers are going to be able to share your same passion. So when we started Digium and we were a few people, I mean, everybody was just like lived and breathed asterisk all the time. I mean, it's just really embedded, and, and when you brought somebody in, if they didn't have that passion, there was just no way you'd consider it. But by the time you're 125 people, you know, you can't always find people that are absolutely as passionate as you are about open source software. You're gonna get, you know, somebody, you need an accountant, and you're not gonna find an accountant that is just like, man, Asterisk is, I, I go home and I play with Asterisk on my Linux box, I mean, it's just, there are not a lot of those, and you have to understand that some people are coming to work because that's their job, and, and they like working there, but they're not, they don't share that same passion. And that's, a, that's something that, that changes, and you just have to kind of accept it. As best you can, you want to try to maintain your culture. Um, again, some things, it's gonna, some things just have to change. You can't have it all the same way, you know. We, we had to cut back on the amount of alcohol that we had sitting around the office, you know, because, again, you know, HR was concerned that with, you know, 16-year-old kids and beer in the fridge, that, that could potentially be a problem. So, you know, there, there are little things. But you, you focus on kind of what makes you special, you know, which for us was a lot about, you know, trying to have good communication, trying to be open not only in terms of our software, but in terms of what we communicate to people. So you know, we have monthly town hall meetings where we go through you know, how our numbers did, what was our profitability like, what are the challenges we've got, who are our big customers, try to keep everybody in the loop, and that's a, you know, that's a big part of what our culture is. So you kind of have to pick what you're, gonna, what you're gonna battle. And as it gets bigger, you get to enjoy, to some degree, your company's independence. So when you, when you are first starting a company, you, know, you are the cog that makes that thing run. But when you get bigger, when you get the size of Digium, you know, I mean, I can, like, disappear for two or three days to go fly somewhere and then come back and everything's still pretty much working. And, you know, it, it, you get to actually enjoy your life outside of work a little bit. Um, this is a, a little bit of a kind of a sad story, but 
uh, one of my mentors was uh, Mark Smith, who is the founder of Adtran. And I remember uh, meeting with him in, uh, in January or, I guess it was January, February of 07. It was just after Danny had come to work. Uh, and yeah, that was kind of a little bit awkward since I'd hired the president of his company to come work for me. But uh, uh, I, uh, I asked him, I said, when did you feel like you could kind of let things go enough to enjoy what, you know, what you'd made with your life? And he thought about it and he said, way too late. And he passed away two months after that. And so, you know, you've got to kind of be able to enjoy things a little bit. And, and that goes for any career, really, but especially as an entrepreneur. And um, understand that, you know, that like if you look at Digium, the success that Digium has had so far is really... Um, the work of many, many people. There's so many people that have played a role in it. It's not like Digium is this company that, that Mark made. It's Digium is this conglomeration of the effort of hundreds of people working together, each contributing their part, and each reflecting a piece of themselves in what is the culture of the company. So, you know, you've got to kind of keep all that in mind and enjoy the kind of transition that you have uh, as the company grows. Right. And then uh, part seven is death. I mean, that's kind of... <laughs> didn't really want to talk about death in a company. Hopefully it's not really you know, going to die. Um, but you do think about what is your long-term goal with it. So for some people, you want to have a lifestyle company where you, know, you just kind of draw money from it. And that's, that's great, by the way. If you're going to do that, though, don't get venture capital because venture capital is going to force you into the bet the farm big strategy, which is try to grow the company into, you know, something really huge and go public or find uh, someone to acquire the company. And uh, as soon as you take venture, you are really pushed into this category. Now, we were kind of pushed into this category anyway just by the nature of where we were. There, there are not like little telecom companies that make products for an entire industry. I mean, we knew that Asterisk was either going to have to be really big or Digim was going to have to be really big to be able to support asterisk, uh, or that somebody else would come in and, and take it over. So we knew we were going to have to be in the bet the farm big uh, category. But, but if you're starting out, you don't necessarily have to be in there. And there's a lot of benefits to that first one, too. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. And so I guess I'll reserve the rest of the time for questions. I think we've got about 10 minutes. So ask away. Somebody's got I was I was very fortunate. Well, let me address that in two pieces. Bring in the management team. I, I was really, really, really lucky because um, I had worked with Danny, our CEO, for years and years. He'd been on our board representing Adtran, which had bought a little piece of the company er earlier on. And in that capacity, Danny was a board member, and I really came to appreciate what he knew and his knowledge. And he was never in a position of being in a job interview, so I knew how he really operated. So that was a, a very, very fortuitous thing that, that that's the route that I could go. I think it's much harder when you bring in management teams with people that you're having to you know, interview. And even if you have them in for three or four days, I mean, when you bring in somebody that's a you know, chief operating officer or something, this is not like you know, hiring another employee. Everything has to be right. Personality is incredibly important. You've got to, when you bring in a management team, it's got to be someone that the other people in the company can respect, that they can work with, that they can appreciate. Um, the, the harder part is really that when you, when you do that, you, you know, there's, there's sometimes going to be people that they want to bring, and that's just kind of the way it is. And you, you need to, again, when you bring in somebody, you've got to trust them to do what they're going to do. Um, and some people at the company are going to be able to make that transition, and some people at the company will have a lot of difficulty making a, a transition like that. The second thing about control, when I brought in the management team and I brought in venture capital, I went to great lengths to assure that I would maintain control of the board, that I would maintain uh, majority shares, you know, all kinds of stuff to, to maintain control. Um, but the reality is, that you're only successful if you can get everybody working together. 
So whether or not you have control at the end, if you're with a team that you really respect, I mean, it's fine, but it's not, it's not that big a deal because if, you, if, the, if the management team is not getting along, then it's not going to be good anyway. You, you all have to kind of work together as a group anyway. So the, you know, whether I could you know, fire Danny or he could fire me is kind of irrelevant because we have, we have to work together to, to have the company be able to be successful anyway. Man, most creative. There's actually a group at New York University, um, which is actually in the art departments. They're uh, the what is it the fine uh, the yeah what is it the interactive telecommunications uh, something it I keep wanting to say itu but I don't think that's it. Um, anyway, uh, they actually are essentially a group of artists that use asterisk more or less as a medium for doing different kinds of things. So um, they had uh, just some examples. There was a guy that, that uh, made an application called I Plate You, where you could leave messages for people based on their license plate numbers. And you know, if they cut you off, you could leave some really angry message. Or you know, <laughs> if you thought they were really hot and you could make a, you know, try to set up a date, you could do that. Um, there was a, a group that did a play in the New York, one of the New York train stations, the Canal Street station. So you would call from like this toll-free number from one of the payphones, and it would cover like part of the play that happens in that area, and then it would tell you a different payphone to go to, and you go to this other payphone, and then you'd hear another part that happens in another area. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, do what? Botana calls, yeah, I know, but that gets so much coverage. But yeah, there's a group that made uh, a system called Botana calls so that your plants could call you when they're low on water. Or, um, <laughs> and that was kind of that was one of the first really cool apps. There was a there's a guy that's got a company doing big games. So imagine like in a movie theater or a screen like this that there's a game on the screen, and you call into a number with your cell phone and you use your like DTMF digits as like a controller for the game. So you know you might have like a little character or whatever, and you're moving around a maze with your phone, and you're competing or playing with all the other people that are in the room, all using their cell phones to uh, to be able to play. Uh, I think those are I'm trying to think of there. There's the uh, the booty dialer, which allowed you to upload your booty call list, and it would call them in sequence for you, and then connect you with the first available <laughs> candidate. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, it's, it's really about applying the technology to whatever your needs are. <laughs> and I guess there are people that are really just that busy. But. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think she did, but she, uh, she did the, uh, the voice for the, um, that thing. They had a, an Astros Power Roomba. You know the Roomba, the little vacuum cleaner? So they had like hooked up a Linksys router and put asterisk on it and then used that to control the Roomba so that you could control the Roomba with DTMF. And you would be, do like, you know, you'd press like four and it would go, you'd hear Allison go, start sucking. And then you press <laughs> six and you'd be like, stop sucking. So those are probably some of the funnier like random prompts I've heard her do. I don't think I've got the. Well, telecom generally is a world of a lot of uh, coopetition, and so it's it can sometimes be hard to draw the lines uh, between them. But um, it's just a mixture. I'd say we have more partners than we have uh, competitors. But some of the competitors are, are really difficult when they try to misrepresent things about your company, you know. and Because, um, you know, it's competition. Sometimes some people play more fair than others. And uh, 
and again, it's not so much from just the business side, but from from the emotional side of being, hey, I went out and created this this package, and now look what people are doing. You know, makes it uh, that's just the part that makes it harder more so than than uh, directly all the business competition. No, there was nothing on Pigeon. There was no uh, making any money off of Pigeon at all. Right, we sell, we actually sell a subscription, which is a good model, by the way, for people doing open source, because um, it lets you just try to come up with a value that you can kind of lump in that people are buying on a recurring basis. But um, we sell a subscription around it that includes support and updates and um, I think you get some other stuff too, like some backups and you know data backup and things. Uh, and then we sell a lot of hardware related to Astro, so connecting to the phone system, plus people—I mean, to the phone network, plus people that buy phone systems, especially the channel that actually delivers phone systems, tend to want little boxes that they can just put on the wall. They don't really get this, you know, take a PC and put. A card in it and install software. It's just not what most PBX dealers do. I mean, they're they're just used to buying a box and they put it on the wall and there's a you know set price list and learn how to configure it and so on. So we actually make systems that are really just packaging asterisk in a dedicated appliance with hardware and and you know a fancy GUI and so on that can be uh, mounted and installed by. Uh, by dealers, and then we go out and build kind of a traditional dealer network to go out and, and sell those products to customers. Have you ever gotten niched and then tried to break out of it? Um, yeah, to some degree, that's a good uh, that's a good question. So when we started Astros, you know, we made cards, and we made you know, but we never thought about building a whole solution. We were all about building components when we started. And that was just a, um, there's only so much market that you're going to capture that way. And that was the niche that we started in. And then now we're going after a much broader market, which demands kind of a put-together solution. And, and they value things differently. The, the market, when we sold our cards in that, into you know, people that are just you know, end users, those end users have to be sophisticated. They care about open source. They, you know, they want to support the project. You know, they know what they're doing. Supporting them is very different from what it is to support. You know, a, a reseller doesn't know anything about Linux. Doesn't care anything about open source. Um, you know, that's just a whole different kind of ballpark. And so, you know, there's a lot of new infrastructure to be able to go support that. So now we really we do both of them. But that was really a niche that we kind of started in. And I think we've got about two minutes left. Okay, I've only got 30 seconds, so I'll try to make it quick. Um, okay. <laughs> when, you, when you build an appliance, the idea is that everything is contained and people know exactly what it is that it does. So maybe you can add a card to it or something like that, but in terms of the software, you want the software build and the set of cards that go in it to be fairly static so that it's nice and controlled and you know what it's going to do. If you're building something yourself, then you know you can go out and buy PCs that don't look like PCs, where you can kind of pretend for your customer that it's not a PC when it really is. When it says the appliance that's on there, there has a there is a an expectation of what that box is going to do and what it's capable of doing and what the testing is and everything like that. So we are fairly controlled in terms of the software that we will put on a system that carries 
our, carries the appliance name on it. Um, we do also have um, asterisk appliances that are not specifically tied to the prepackaged stuff that might be able to be useful. All right. If you have any other questions, you can ask me after this. So, go ahead. Thank you. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike Version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.